So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Essi. Thank you so much, Makonan. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here. Good morning. Welcome everyone uh, to our webinar series, the Nile River Basin in Crisis, Water Sharing and Transboundary Conflict or Cooperation. Um, this series of talks is happening at a really critical moment as um, we all know Ethiopia has now filled the Grand, Ennis, Grand, Grand Renaissance Dam um, on the Blue Nile at its border with Sudan. Um, the GERD is the largest hydropower project in Africa and is expected to be fully operational by 2023. Um, and of course, the situation has been escalating since uh, construction began over a decade ago as it challenged um, Egypt's uh, control over the flow of the Nile as a downstream user established during the colonial period in the early 20th century, even though 80% of the water that flows into the Nile uh, begins in the Ethiopian highlands. Um, and of course, even though the focus has been on Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia, and there are 11 riparian nations that share the river and difficult questions about what will happen with hazards like drought, more dams being planned, growing populations, and of course the climate in ch is changing, which adds to the precarity. So it's a, a tremendous honor that we have Dr. Kevin Wheeler here with us today, the Oxford uh, Martin Fellow at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford, who will be giving his presentation uh, titled The GERD Dam Filling Impact and Mitigation Strategies. Uh, before Dr. Wheeler begins, I would like to introduce him. Uh, he's an engineer and project manager with over 15 years of experience in water resource planning and engineering, hydrologic and hydro hydraulic systems modeling, water delivery system design and construction, and stakeholder education and capacity building. Kevin focuses on facilitating stakeholder involvement in managing water resources by providing technical support with current modeling tools, facilitating community organization and promoting dialogue between water users for seeking solutions to complex water management problems. With experience ranging from large scale water management to small scale community construction projects in both urban and remote environments, Dr. Wheeler provides a bridge between the policy and the practical aspects of water management. He's been working extensively on the Colorado River Basin for over a decade, another contentious uh, transboundary water, uh, um, uh, water body, including the facilitation of the negotiations between the United States and Mexico over sharing the resources of the river. Starting with the Colorado River Interim Surplus Guidelines, Dr. Wheeler played a central role by developing the tools necessary to bring stakeholders together throughout the basin to understand and interpret proposed policies and also works, worked alongside the Bureau of Reclamation and a variety of stakeholders to facilitate required modeling of the development of the multi-species conservation program. Um, over the last 10 years, he has consulted federal, state, private, nonprofit entities that all have interest in management of the Colorado River. Dr. Wheeler currently supports the ongoing development of the Eastern Nile region through model development, stakeholder training, and exploring alternatives for cooperation and coordination of river infrastructure. He completed his PhD at the Environmental Change Institute in 2017 while collaborating with research institutions in Addis Ababa, uh, Khartoum, and Cairo. Please join me this morning in welcoming Dr. Kevin Wheeler to give his talk. Um, he'll speak till about nine and then we'll open it for, for Q&A. So welcome and thank you so much, uh, Kevin, for being with us this morning. Thank you, Dr. AC, for that introduction. I think that's the most comprehensive introduction I think I've ever had. Wow. <clears throat> um, it's an honor to be here. Um, I, I've been looking forward to this uh, for a while. I've given lots of talks recently, um, but this one has, has had an excellent series of speakers uh, on it. So it's um, definitely uh, uh, kudos to, to Ed and to McConan for, um, for putting this together. Um, so following a lot of what people have done already, I'm going to uh, uh, build upon that, but I'll go back a little bit and I'm going to go ahead and start my, are you looking at my, my, my big screen or my little screen right now? If I, neither probably right now, there we go, share screen. There we go. Okay. And now I'm going to. Okay, and you see my, my presentation mode right now? Yes, we can see your presentation. Okay, excellent. Okay, so, uh, so 
we wanted to give a little bit of a background on on, on the now in general, but 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 move pretty quickly into uh, into focusing on the, the the current situation, the filling strategies. Um, first thing I want to point out: we've been talking about the Nile River Basin in crisis, um, and and uh, we don't you don't use that term lightly though. Um, crisis is really a, it's definitely in a point of, of change of of transformation right now. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of people that 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 believe it's a crisis situation. Um, uh, but, um, but we have to be careful with some of this wording sometimes because it can really inflame things. Uh, and we wanted to kind of unpack, okay, what is the real, uh, what is the real level of crisis and risk right now versus now, now and in the future? So my outline here, I'm going to talk about some important details and rationale of the GERD, uh, the status of the reservoir uh, and, and the structure itself. Uh, what are some of the very, uh, the physical and very real risks of filling the GERD? Uh, what are some of the possible approaches that have been looked at and could be looked at? Um, uh, further on filling the GERD, and what are some tangible steps that can be taken today uh, um, towards reaching agreement, uh, getting getting closer to reaching a comprehensive agreement between the countries. Now, this is one of my my favorite uh, maps that I, I like to start out with. It's from uh, called the Book of Curiosities uh, from the 10th to 11th century, um, and it's a beautiful map. And if you look at this, uh, you see the area of the Nile. Um, the downstream area is, is Egypt, and the upstream area is Ethiopia. I'm always, uh, there are always thoughts that the, that the Nile came from the mountains of the moon, was the, at least the lore within, within European culture. Um, uh, but it's a beautiful map, but it really, um, to me, it really, it really shows the linkage. The, the countries aren't that far apart because they've known forever, Egypt has always known that, that Ethiopia is synonymous with the source of, with the source of their water. So here's our here's our, our geography lesson uh, for those that are new to the Nile. Very quickly, um, the headwaters people typically think of Lake Victoria, um, and there's also a headwater lake of Lake Tana in Ethiopia. Now, from Lake Victoria flows um, often called the Victoria, the Albert Nile, into the Sud uh, wetlands or Sud swamps, where about half of the water gets evapotranspirated, and then flows on as the White Nile up into the city of Khartoum or capital of Sudan. Meanwhile, the Blue Nile flows from Lake Tana uh, uh, down from the highlands of Ethiopia and merges, merges with the White Nile right in the middle of, of, of Khartoum, one of my favorite cities. And you can put your hands in both sides of the river as it comes together. Um, uh, it's a, a beautiful place to be. And then it flows northward as the main Nile uh, through the deserts in northern Sudan and through Egypt and the High Aswan Dam, uh, the beautiful city of Cairo, and out to the Mediterranean Sea. Here's the border between Ethiopia and Sudan, and the GERD is being constructed just upstream um, of the border. So if we were to put a hydrologic map next to it, sort of representing the hydrology, the thickness of the lines on this map um, is, uh, represents the, 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 the volume of water, essentially. Um, and we can see that about 30% of the water comes from the White Nile, about 13% comes from the Atbara River, a very, a very intermittent tributary. And then 57% comes from the Blue Nile. So we often hear about, um, no, we'll keep going here. So that forms the 100% of water flowing into Lake Nasser uh, in Egypt. Here's where the dam sits. Um, it's, it's along the Blue Nile and about 53% of the overall water comes from uh, above the blue above the Ethiopian dam site, the construction site, and the other 4% below. So we often hear 80, 85% of the water um, uh, is affected. Well, not totally, about 85% of the water, 80, 85% of the water comes from Ethiopia, but part of that comes down uh, the Abara, part of that comes down the, the, the Baro, the Baro Club was Sabat tributary, um, but about 50, say 50 to 50 to 55% or so, um, is what really comes has uh, comes through the GERD site um, before it goes into Egypt. So um, it's important to remember um, to try to understand sort of the, the the level of control it has. It has a significant control, a significant part of water of the water flowing in Egypt, but not all of it, less than half of it. I mean, not sorry, a little bit more than half of it. Okay, so to put some context of the of the modern historical development on the Nile. Egypt in 1902 constructed the, the, the Aswan Dam. If anybody uh, tuned in to um, Terry Tavert's uh, um, uh, talk a few weeks ago, it was excellent about the history. Um, so the Aswan Dam built in 1902 um, uh, during Brit British colonial uh, period. 
followed by the Sonar Dam and the Jebel Ulia Dam, um, 25 and 37. And that was on the Blue Nile and the uh, on the on the um, the Blue Nile and White Nile, respectively, or the White Nile and Blue Nile, respectively. Um, and then the High Aswan Dam constructed uh, following the 1959 agreement between Egypt and Sudan. Uh, that was constructed over the 1960s. And that displaced about 50,000 people, more or less, um, uh, or Sudanese uh, that were relocated to the Kashim al Hirba um, on, the, um, on the Abara tributary. And they constructed the, the Kashim al Hirba um, Dam there. Uh, the 1959 agreement also um, uh, included the construction of the Rosaris Dam uh, on, on the Blue Nile that allowed a lot um, to expand the agriculture within Sudan. Sudan's largest dam to date is the Moroi Dam, completed in 2009. Um, and it's a beautiful place I've been to several times and got to know the dam operators pretty well there. The Tekizi Dam was the first large dam on, in, within, the, uh, within, the Blue, uh, within the Nile Basin within Ethiopia in 2009. <laughs> the Tanabellus project uh, that brought water straight from uh, Lake Tana um, and down to basically into the GERD site today. And the Upper Abara and Satit uh, complex was finished in Sudan in 2015. So the GERD is one of a long line of uh, a history within construction of the dam over the last, over the last 100 years. So the GERD location, if you were to zoom in on that on that location, this is what the GERD footprint or the, or the reservoir for the, the uh, of the GERD will, will look like. The average annual flow of the GERD is about 49 billion cubic meters, and the total storage volume of the GERD uh, reservoir is about 74 billion cubic meters. With an average store or uh, active storage of about 59 billion cubic meters. So, the ratio of active storage to average annual flow is 1.2. Now, why is that important? Okay, this metric of, uh, of this ratio of active storage to average annual storage. Here, if, if, if there's a large reservoir with a small river coming into it, <coughs> we can say that ratio is large, it's greater than one. So there's a high level of engineering control. On the other hand, <coughs> if there's a large river coming into a small reservoir, it has a low ratio, so a low level of engineering control. So the higher that number is, the more control that reservoir has over its particular location. So if you look at the High Aswan Dam, <coughs> pardon me, I'm still getting over cold, the High Aswan Dam and the GERD, they have ratio, ratios of about 1.5 to 1.2 on them. Now, all of the other dams, have much smaller numbers. All the gray numbers there you see are tiny in comparison. There's one outlier there, <coughs> which is the Tekiza Dam because it's a very small tri trickle coming in um, at that location. Uh, but for the most part, we can really see that the GERD and the Aswan Dam are the major players in terms of uh, controlling and engineering the river. Um, the rest are, are fairly small. <coughs> Here's what the GERD looks like. There's two dams actually. The main dam is 155 meters high, uh, 1.8 kilometers long, and a saddle dam, which is only 50 meters high, but it's over five kilometers long, creating the extra, extra 50 meters of storage space, basically. The main construction of the dam, it's roller compacted concrete. Um, it's a tiered design. Uh, so it's got a central spillway in it that we'll look a little more, a little more in detail, uh, but basically it's a, a, a mechanism that can uh, they continue to pile concrete on top of it. Um, the main construction by an Italian company, Cellini, are now called WeBuild, or a subsidiary WeBuild now, <coughs> and Metec, an Ethiopian company, uh, was originally in charge of the, um, of the, uh, of the electromechanical, <coughs> and that's transformed through the years. Okay, the dam and turbine conf configuration. About 13, or there, no, about, there, there's 13 turbines, 11 normal turbines and two low head turbines, and the installed capacity is 5,150 megawatts. Very large. There's a perspective of it. <coughs> the design has changed several times through the years, the number of turbines, uh, but it's back to sort of 5,150. That's pretty stable now. <coughs> that saddle dam, here's a picture of it, 50 meters in, uh, 50 meter height, over five kilometers in length. Um, but a very long structure and a lot of concerns about, about the geology around that area is what, um, 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 what's often noted, um, but certainly, uh, uh, certainly an impressive feature. 
Okay, what's the impact for Ethiopia of energy production? What's the reasons why they're building this dam? Well, it's going to double. We can see that there's about 15 terawatt hours per year of energy that would be generated by this dam. And of course, that's the combination of the flows as well as the hydraulic head, the size of the dam, but fifth, rough, roughly doubling the, um, uh, the energy generation. Um, so it will truly be an enormous step change for Ethiopia and the region if they're able to, to harness that much hydropower and whoever is able to, to benefit from it. Of course, there's also concerns <coughs> or questions about how rapidly can Ethiopia actually use this amount of energy. <coughs> They've been working hard on building the, the, the distribution lines, including distribution lines abroad into Kenya, um, uh, um, into, into Sudan, Djibouti, uh, to be able to sell this electricity in the East African power pool. So the reasons for building the GERD, support Ethiopian growth and development, promote regional growth and development. Hydropower is the primary purpose of this, and that's a non-consumptive use. <clears throat> and we'll talk a little more about the, about the details on that. Um, the reservoir really can't be physically used for significant water diversion. It's situated at the lowest point within Ethiopia. <clears throat> of course, Sudan could benefit from it, we'll talk about in a second, um, but it's really, a, itself is a, is, is a non-consumptive use, except for some evaporation losses. An important point is the more, uh, the more important electricity is, the more water will flow downstream to Sudan and, and Egypt. So it's very good for Sudan and Egypt that Ethiopia generate electricity, because that allows the water to continue downstream. Um, those two, those two needs are very compatible with each other. <coughs> so a framing of the forthcoming risks. A paper we published um, back, in, back in 2020, and a lot of this was, was, was the, the idea of Professor Dale Whittington, uh, who's been a mentor for me and, and, um, and really guided a lot, of, a lot of the thinking in this while I'm doing a lot of the modeling work. So we really broke up um, the analysis into, into three different eras. One being the filling period of the GERD, which we could say we're currently in right now. It's basically bringing the reservoir from empty to a full state. A second area that we call a new normal, if the reservoir is full and operating in normal conditions, average hydrology or wet, wet hydrology or even minor droughts. And then a third state, a multi-year drought. What would happen if another severe drought like what occurred in the 1980s, um, drew the reservoir down, all the reservoirs down, and then had to refill afterwards. So that was the general framing that we had, that we, we used for this paper, and, and, and believe it's a very robust way to, way to think about the, um, the, the, the situation in the Nile. So we're gonna focus a lot in this talk on the filling, because that's what I was asked to do. This, so next we'll talk about the status of the GERD reservoir and the filling itself. So if we look at a profile of the GERD, this is, represents this triangle shape, represents the dam itself and the water stacked up behind it. And we can see there's, um, there's a part below the main intakes to the reservoir we call the dead zone in a dam. And that's basically the water that, that once it's stored, it never, never can really leave the reservoir. And that's about 4.9 billion cubic meters. There's an inactive zone, um, about 10.1 billion cubic meters. Then there's an active zone of about 59 billion cubic meters that, that, in which the reservoir can operate. And that includes um, an annual operation zone right now um, <clears throat> that, Eth that Ethiopia intends to operate the dam from a full supply level at 640 down to 625 meters. So the operation zone ideally for Ethiopia in this red, red area, we call that the continuous power operation range. And this is really defined by, uh, by the turbines, um, 103 meters of head above the, the, the tailwater or the, or the downstream side of, um, of, of the reservoirs uh, puts it into sort of the, the, the ideal or the, the, uh, um, the, the highly, the, the optimal um, operation range. It could certainly go below that, but Ethiopia generally wouldn't want to do that uh, because then the efficiency of the turbines really starts going down. <clears throat> um, so they really want to try to operate it within, within this range. Um, and that's going to vary from about 603 to 613, depending on what the tailwater elevation is. Um, but these are some of the numbers um, that they play with in the negotiations quite a bit, which is the bottom of, of this continuous operation zone. Now, of course, the optimal operation zone is further towards the top, because the more full the reservoir is, the higher energy they can generate per drop of water. So it's about 630 to 640 <coughs> would be ideal. But of course, they can't operate at that high always, because they want to generate regular electricity. 
<coughs> so here's what the basic filling plan for the GERD has been for, for quite some time. So broken up into four different stages, the first stage would first bring the reservoir level up to six uh, up to 525 where they would store that dead storage of 4.9 then they would bring it up further to be able to activate all of the turbines to uh, bring it up to 595 so that's kind of the initial stage getting the turbines working and then for the next next several years the the, the basic plan has been to store about 10 to 10.5 billion cubic meters each year until until it's full and then it reaches its level of 625 and then it would, end, it would enter a regular operation phase So they called them in stages so the time scale could be flexible. Um, and, it, and, and of course, construction projects are always, always delayed. But, um, so, but in 2020 is when the first, that first uh, part of the first stage happened. They captured 4.9 billion cubic meters. Uh, the next, um, the, to complete stage one, uh, it did not complete in this last year. And so we'll probably go into 2022. Um, so, but we don't know exactly how the, how the next years will play out. Um, depends a lot on the discussions that are going on and the hydrology, et cetera. Um, but it could could uh, could take up now 2020, uh, 2025 or so to finish filling. But we don't we don't really know. Um, so so I'm not going to not going to speculate any further than that. So if we put this next to the next to the profile itself, we can see the basic filling plan in year one, 4.9 billion cubic meters was was retained. And that was about nine percent of the flow at the GERD location and about 5% of the natural flow um, at, the, at, at Aswan. In the second year, the intention was to capture 13.5 billion cubic meters, which would have been all over a quarter of the flow of the, of the GERD, of the flow in the, of the Blue Nile at the location, about 15% of the high Aswan dam, or of the storage coming into the high Aswan dam, or the flows coming into the high Aswan dam, to be, to be accurate. And above that, roughly 10 to 10.5 billion cubic meters each, each year. <coughs> so now if we're to look at the at the, the hydraulics of the dam itself, the outlets. There are four diversion tunnels, and these are basically to be used during the construction process. Two bottom outlets, which are, are low elevation outlets, also being used during the construction process and to, to, to draw down the reservoir uh, without and not generate electricity on these. Two main turbine banks on the left and on the right a gated spillway off to the side, and an emergency spillway in the center, uh, which is also um, uh, referred to as a low block spillway during the construction process. So if we look at, <coughs> at the reservoir itself, a picture of the reservoir, we can see our four diversion culverts here. And we can see the two bottom outlets right here, just above it. The two early, genera or early generation turbines are located over here on this side. Let's see here. Let's do my pointer option. There we go, my laser pointer here. And here's the 11 normal turbines on both sides. There we go. And the low block spillway is essentially a spillway where the water will pass through during the wet season. And then during the dry season, they would build it up higher. So as the dam gets constructed, the low block spillway would fall, would lag behind. And that's how, that's how the water would basically be passed through during the wet season until the dam is um, up to the top elevation. Okay, so here's how the process has gone so far in the filling. So I got this from, from uh, my colleague, uh, Mohammed Bashir. He'll be giving a talk next week, I believe, uh, him with uh, Hisham el -Dadiri. <clears throat> um, but I, 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 he get, uh, allowed me to use, uh, use this, this uh, figure, which I appreciated, modified a little bit. So from January in, uh, in 2020 um, to June of 2020, basically the dry season, Ethiopia was able to elevate the, the low block spillway elevation to about 560 meters. As the wet season began and higher flows came in, this allowed the reservoir level to start rising. And then the four diversion, culver, uh, cul uh, diversion outlets were reduced down to two. And then it continued rising up to an elevation of about 560 to 565 meters when water could start flowing over the top of that spillway. <clears throat> so it was really based on how, on how high that spillway was built. 
At that point, they captured their 4.9 billion cubic meters <clears throat> in 2020. <clears throat> so then the dry season in January would come again, the flows would go down. And the first thing, of course, is the water would stop flowing over the spillway. At that point, they could start constructing the, uh, the, the low block spillway higher again. Now the plan was to build it up to 595 um, and to retain an additional 13.5 billion cubic meters. They opened the bottom outlets and, and shut off the diversion outlets in the bottom. So it brought the reservoir down, or, or sorry, then the wet season began, high flows began. That brought the reservoir down a little bit and then filled back up, but only to about 576 meters of elevation before the spillway, before the spillway was, was engaged. So at that point, it's pretty clear that, the, that, that it, it did not reach the 595 uh, meter elevation. <clears throat> um, so the low block spillway is roughly five, uh, at 576, and they captured about 3 billion cubic meters um, in 2021. So a total of about 8 billion cubic meters. I won't speculate why it's very difficult. Large construction project, projects are very, are very challenging, especially in remote areas and obviously a lot going on in Ethiopia, but they've retained about 8 billion cubic meters in the reservoir to date, um, my best estimate, estimates. I haven't seen any official numbers released from Ethiopia, but that um, uh, based on looking at lots of satellite and a lot, a lot of photos, it's pretty, pretty clear. But soon they should be able to operate the turbines. They've been working hard, I know, to, to, to get the first turbines, the low head turbines operating um, at, at some point. And we're expecting that at any time, really, they'd start generating some electricity. So what are some of the physical impacts um, and very real impacts of the GERD for both had four there, for both Egypt and, and Sudan? So we'll start out with, with, with the benefits for Sudan. One of the things is it will certainly increase control over the river, which allows greater agricultural development. And that's obviously um, one of the big benefits for Sudan. Could also be one of the bigger risks for, for Egypt as well. <coughs> um, decreasing the amount of sediment transported um, will be a, a large benefit to Sudan um, in terms of, of clogging their agricultural systems. We could also be a risk in terms of in terms of the um, uh, the nutrients and, and brick production that that type of thing. But overall, um, it makes operating their reservoirs much much easier. It'll cause an energy uplift of the Sudanese reservoirs. They'll be able to operate their reservoirs much more efficiently as a result. But the risks to Sudan, and they're very real risks. First off, Sudan, <clears throat> um, predictable operations, near-term operations, operations from the GERD will be absolutely critical for Sudan for a safe operation of their reservoirs. Absolutely critical. And dam safety is really the number one priority for Sudan. Dig into those a little bit more. So Sudan's concerns are really based on this reality. The GERD reservoir right here and the Rosaris reservoir, their next, the, the, the Sudanese reservoir is only about 150, 15 kilometers downstream. <clears throat> and it's only about 20 kilometers from the GERD site to the border. So the releases from the GERD go directly into, into in the Rosaris and the storages are vastly different. The GERD was 74 billion cubic meters and the Rosaris at 5.9 billion cubic meters. So the main story here, the GERD is much larger than the Rosaris Dam, which is immediately downstream. So just a little, a little schematic here. <clears throat> if the, the active storage of, of the Rosaris is 5.8 billion cubic meters, the GERD already has more water than Rosaris can, and, and it's just started filling. If this is the GERD, this is the Rosaris Dam. Sudan must be prepared to store or pass any releases that are made from the GERD constantly must be very prepared to do that instantaneously. So they may need to draw down the reservoir. For example, if they open up the bottom outlets to be able to have space to, to, to capture that water <clears throat> or open their gates to be able to pass that water downstream. They have to know that well in advance. <clears throat> when, when Ethiopia raises up the low block spillway, Rosaris may need to empty out quite a bit to be able to prepare for, for what's going to happen. So when the, when the water level rises behind the GERD and water starts spilling over the top, Rosaris is ready to pass that water very quickly or capture that water very quickly. Obviously, as soon as it starts spilling over the top, it's a dramatic change in the hydrology. <clears throat> and Rosaris in Sudan 
must be ready for that um, um, uh, and, and, to have, and to expect exactly when it's going to come. So establishing communication protocols between the dam operators is critical. From engineer to engineer, from dam operator to dam operator in two reservoirs, that close is absolutely critical to do. Rosari's dam operators must know how much water to expect every day. This is standard in all rivers around the world that are gonna operate this close. The dam operators have to be able to communicate with each other. Exchanging of real-time pool elevation measurements and knowing the status of the construction is absolutely critical to be able to achieve this. Now, typically you'd have an operation plan, a short-term operation plan, five-day, 10-day operation plan that would be updated continuously every day or every couple of days so there's constant a report coming from the upstream dams to the downstream dams of how much water they can expect to receive <coughs> every day. What is the plan? That's very important for the, for the engineers to operate the reservoirs properly in a safe way. Now, these aren't necessarily legally binding numbers uh, for daily releases, but it's safe engineering practice and shows good faith operations of the upstream dam to the downstream dams. So I see this as an opportunity for good faith engineering collaboration, and it's, and it's absolutely critical for safety, without a doubt. Let's get to talk about dam safety itself, the structure itself. So the truth is nobody wants this dam to fail. Sudan definitely doesn't want the dam to fail. Ethiopia has invested so much into this. They don't want the dam to fail, and I don't believe Egypt would want the dam to fail either. Nobody wants this dam to fail. There currently is no definitive evidence of, of any safety risks on of, of the dam, not that I've seen, at least. However, there's been a lot of studies that have been analyzing the dam. What would happen if it were to break? How what, what would be the flood wave coming downstream? So a lot of a lot of very of, of very catastrophic analyses of what would happen if something were to happen, were to occur. There also have been some satellite-based monitoring studies. One recently came out that was assessing the vertical displacement of the, of the Ethiopian dam. Um, Using satellite technology, um, and they came up with some pretty, pretty, pretty interesting, in, interesting results. Looking from satellites, um, they were saying that the main dam displacement of 90 millimeters, saddle dam of 380 millimeters, definitely, definitely caught a lot of people's attention for sure. One thing to note: I mean, these the satellite measurements are useful, but any dam engineering project is going to have measurements on the ground, measuring very closely. So these methods are not substitutes for ground-based evidence for sure. Um, certainly useful to bring us more information, um, but ground-based evidence is really what's needed to be able to show what's actually happening uh, going on in the river. So the burden of proof is real on Ethiopia to provide an assurance of safety, particularly to Sudan immediately downstream. So studies like this can be very informative of what you can see from, from satellites, but really this burden of proof, I would see it as, again, as an opportunity for Ethiopia to provide assurance of safety. Again, this would be a good opportunity for, for, for good faith engineering and scientific collaboration to share this sort of knowledge and to bring, bring the accuracy or, or, or highlight, highlight exactly what the, what the safety status is of the dam. And of course that changes, changes through time during the filling process. Okay, so what are the risks to Egypt? The key question, straight to it. Will Egypt suffer water shortages during or after the filling of the GERD? That's what everybody wants to know. A couple of major points. Egypt is currently very well prepared for this. Impacts will depend significantly on the hydrology during the filling period. Will it be dry? Will it be wet? Will it be average? <clears throat> and we're going to show a bit more details into this. Okay, this is the storage of the High Aswan Dam since it, since it started filling back in the 1960s. We can see at the full supply level here, and down at the bottom is the minimum operation level. So one thing we notice right away is it's very full right now. The Aswan Dam, High Aswan Dam is currently at its maximum capacity. Very, very full right now. And I just took this a couple of days ago. We can find this off satellites, no mystery. Um, the lines below are the drought management levels. According to, according to Egypt's policy, if the, if the storage level falls below 60 billion cubic meters, they start reducing their releases down into the population, down, in, down into, in, into Egypt. So reducing by 5%, by 10%, by 15%. But this is the area that, that they, would, they would certainly like to avoid. But currently it's very, it's very full. So if we were to look at this in terms of elevation as opposed to storage, 
we can see right at 175, that's typically, that has historically has been their, their flood space elevation. They'd try to bring it down to 175 every year to allow space in the reservoir. And we can see now, they've been keeping it much higher than that. Presumably in, in anticipation of the curve. So it's been coming down to about 178 meters. And that is also the level of the spillways. The Toshka spillway, uh, which is on the upstream side of the, of, of the reservoir, <clears throat> um, was 178. That might have been raised. I'm not exactly sure. But one thing for sure is we can see that the Toshka has been overflowing. The spillway has been overflowing at least since October 2019. And this water has been, there's, there's irrigation areas through, uh, throughout that, this part of the, of, the, of the desert. But a lot of this water has been flowing into these lakes inside. So if we were to look at these lakes, in 2019 versus 2020, we can see the difference. This is where the overflow water has been going um, off into the Toshka Lakes and evaporating. Ideally, if the reservoir, if the GERD had been completed, that water would have been captured, it would have been filled, the GERD, the Aswan Dam would have been filled as well, and the, the, the filling would no longer be um, a risk. Okay, so there's been a lot of studies on the GERD um, and what the risks are to Egypt. Back in the International Panel of Experts, the first time there was a group really convened to study what the risks are, risks are to, the, um, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to Egypt or to downstream countries. May 2013, this was a panel of two Egyptians, two Sudanese, two Ethiopians, and four international experts. <clears throat> They're reviewing the studies that have been done. So it's a little fuzzy on this, but it says the preliminary findings of the report are that the water supply in Egypt will not be affected during the first filling of the GERD given wet or average years, although power generation at the High Aswan Dam will de be decreased by about 6% due to general lower lake levels. Should the first filling occur during dry years, the High Aswan Dam will reach its minimum operating level during at least four consecutive years and would have a significant impact on water supply to Egypt and cause the loss of power generation at the High Aswan Dam for extended periods. Okay, so this basically says during wet or average years, there would Egypt would not be affected, but during dry years, it significantly could be affected. Okay, another study. This was conducted by Del Taurus, an independent study by, commissioned by Egypt. This was presented at Cairo Water Week. This is a very good consulting firm that does excellent work, and they came up with very similar results. They said the water available at, at Aswan basically would go down marginally um, uh, uh, on, on average. If you looked at the average acro across across a 115 year time horizon, it would go down. It would go down minimum for water water availability. It also notes that the GERD increases the probability of shortages by about six by about six about six percent seven years out of that 115, 115 years. And it did note that during dry conditions, it could cause additional harm. No doubt. So that falls in line exactly with what happened uh, with what the, the previous International Panel of Experts report did or report reviewed by them. There's been academic analyses also done. So a uh, speaker next week, uh, next week, Hishama el uh, did an excellent paper um, in Journal of Hydrology. We looked at a three-year filling scenario as well as a seven-year filling scenario, starting in a couple different um, starting elevations. Um, 180 meters versus 170s, two meters or so, um, and looked and I was looking at, at what some of the adaptation measures uh, measurement uh, measures might be for Egypt for the High Aswan Dam. I certainly noticed that the reservoir would go down, <clears throat> but in this three-year filling scenario, I said the most probable ending elevation was about 170 meters, um, and they did by standard deviation a range there down to 165 meters, and the seven seven-year filling scenario. Um, it's about came about about 171 meters, about 166 if you took off the standard deviation for that. So comparing with those drought management levels, it's still significantly above the drought management levels. And a lot of that we can see is attributed to the fact that the starting elevation of the High Aswan Dam is full right now. It, it's not depleted, so that's a huge advantage. And 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 and. Uh, um, that's a very, again, a very good thing. The engineers in, in, in Egypt understand this very well. The Aswan Dam will decline, but likely stay well above the drought management zone. <clears throat> okay, there's one notable outlier um, in, these, in, these, uh, in the academics. 
a paper um, uh, put in our environmental research letters, uh, e uh, Egypt's water budget and deficit, uh, suggest and suggested mitigation strategies for the GERD and filling scenarios. This came up with a number that said shortages would be 31 billion cubic meters per year for Egypt. So this, of course, caught everybody's attention that's been studying this for a long time. That seems like a very, a very strange and high number. So we want to look into this a little bit. So in the abstract of this, I'll read this. We estimate that the me median total annual water budget deficit for Egypt during the filling period, considering seepage to the fractured rocks below and around the grid reservoir, as well as the intrinsic water deficit, and assuming no possible mitigation efforts by Egyptian authorities will be 31 billion cubic meters per year, which should surpass one third of Egypt's co total, uh, current total water deficit or budget. <clears throat> so are they su suggesting this deficit is all due to the grid filling? A little strangely worded, but it, it talks about seepage uh, below and around the, around the dam, talks about an intrinsic water deficit and talks about um, no mitigation strategies by Egypt, okay? Okay, at the same time, the University of Southern California, so the, the authors are from, from, from Southern California, released a press statement, said the rapid filling of a giant dam at the headwaters of the Nile River, the world's biggest waterway, supporting millions of people, could reduce water supplies to downstream Egypt by more than one third. So clearly, this news article is saying that it is all due to the GERD. So there's a big disconnect between what was in the abstract and what was in the press releases. Okay, so we wanna dive into how do they derive some of these numbers. <clears throat> First part, intrinsic water deficit, 18.35 <clears throat> billion cubic meters. That's, that's in, in, in line with a lot of other, uh, a lot of other studies out there that, that look at the supply demand deficit of Egypt. And that's, that's where we look at the current total freshwater supply for Egypt minus the current total demand, so the imbalance between those two. This assumes no reuse of agricultural return flows, treated wastewater, shallow groundwater, basically assumes that all water being used is, is fresh water. Um, now we know that that is, uh, that, that agriculture return, return flows um, uh, creates a pretty significant um, uh, uh, amount of water. Um, Yeah, return flows uh, uh, roughly 9.3 oh, 9 uh, billion cubic meters, shallow groundwater usage about 7.5 billion cubic meters, tra treated water, uh, wastewater usage reuse about 4.2 uh, uh, billion cubic meters. Um, so there's a lot of non-conventional uses. So that's what makes up that, that amount of water. So that deficit is really being made up by, by, by Egypt's uh, use of return flows in a lot of ways. Um, so one thing that's important to know, this is not a tribute to the curve. This has nothing to do with the grid at all. This is, this is um, simply due to, uh, uh, due to high demands in, in Egypt. And now the use of return flows is also very common as well. On the Colorado River, there's a lot of use of return flows. All water goes to agriculture, returns back to the river and gets used over and over again. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it is particularly intense within Egypt and the Delta. Okay, the second part of this, of this analysis was the deficits due to seepage losses. And they said about 2.5 billion cubic meters for the median. Now this was derived, um, from, uh, it was the median of some modeling results using uh, modeling results by, by Lirsch et al. that did a sensitivity analysis um, uh, of several different scenarios where they used a high, medium, and low seepage rates, uh, 10 to the minus fifth, 10 to the minus fourth, 10 to the minus third um, uh, of the storage volume. So basically a sensitivity analysis. Of course, there's a lack of actual field data on what the seepage is. I've never been able to see any, any reports on that, but Lish et al. was really doing a, seep, uh, a sensitivity analysis across this. Um, this paper took a median of that. So it really depended on which scenarios they did. They basically, um, yeah, so it was taking a median of a sensitivity analysis rather than, uh, rather than a physically based um, analysis. <clears throat> now, also, and, and Lirsch et al. acknowledged most reservoir seepages return to the river. Um, and that, that, that's true. Most water that goes down or below a dam or under a dam typically comes out downstream in the channel. There's really no clear scientific basis for large perpetual deep percolation losses. But of course, this is something that 
can be and needs to be studied. But really, um, in, in, the, in the Colorado River, we, we, uh, we, we know there, there's some seepage losses, but they return downstream. Again, another opportunity for good faith scientific collaboration to really understand, the, understand this better. Okay, the third part of this, deficits due to retaining water in the GERD. Um, they said 9.64 billion cubic meters. They did not consider the, the Aswan Dam to exist at all when they calculated that. Um, they made an, an assumption that the water retained in the GERD was equal to the deficit in Egypt. And as we can see, that's not accurate. Um, there's often, uh, uh, currently the, the, the Toshka is overflowing, um, but simply looking at the amount of storage that's retained is not the same as looking at how, how it affects Egypt. Depends a lot on the hydrology. Um, there's no consideration for the variable hydrology, and they really took other people's studies, including my own, and misinterpreted them. Um, and used a, a very oversimplified analysis to come up with these numbers, and this wasn't accurate at all. So they added these three numbers together, and they came up, that's 30.49, 30 30 rounded to 31, and put that um, as the impact uh, to Egypt. We are preparing a rebuttal for this paper, and that will, we're hoping to get it published by now, but, but that'll be forthcoming. Okay, so the critical factors when determining the impact of the GERD on Egypt. Hydrology matters. You have to pay attention to hydrology. We've known that for a long time. Every engineer understands that. Wet hydrology, there's no impacts. The average hydrology, either no impact or some proactive policy reductions. Dry hydrology, potentially significant impacts. The initial conditions of the High Oswan Dam map. The retention of the dam is not equal to the amount of shortage for Egypt. So what are the real risks? So a probabilistic look at this. So we would use 103 years of resampled hydrology from 1900 to 2002. This is developed by Del Taris. We integrate that in, 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 into our model. And really we can develop a, a probabilistic profile of what the risks are to the high Aswan Dam. Now this basically represents exceedance and non-exceedance probability, sort of an envelope of where it might be, of, of what, where the elevations might be. And so the first thing we can note, oh, and, and we have to assume a, an operation of the, of, of the GERD, and I, we do a fairly conservative operation that would be one of the worst case scenarios for Egypt in this, um, where they try to retain 10.5 every year um, uh, and only minimum releases of 31 per year. Um, but what we can see right away is in the red line, the median reservoir, median high Aswan Dam reservoir stays above the drought management zone. It does not dive down into that zone. But there is a possibility, a 30% probability of entering into that drought management zone. So it is possible for sure. And there's a less than 5% probability that would come to those very extreme shortages. And that's, and that's very real. So it's a much more nuanced, much more um, probabilistic view of what of what the risks are. So if we look at the shortages here, this is the shortages to Egypt's objective release. If they want to try to get 55.5 billion cubic meters, which is the, uh, based on the 1959 agreement with, with Sudan, we can see right away there's a small probability of large shortages, 8, 10, up to 14 billion cubic meters. This would be very significant for Egypt, absolutely, without a doubt, but it's a pretty small probability less than 5%, appears less than 1%. A tangible probability of small policy-induced shortages. No doubt, 10% probability, 15, 20, 30% even, but most likely, no additional shortages. No, there's no 50% line on this. So the most likely case is there will not be any shortages to Egypt. However, there's always a small probability there could be very large shortages. So, to do this properly, you really have to understand this from a statistical point of view. So where does that leave the negotiations? Both sides have often said most issues have been resolved. And there's a lot of things to work out still, um, but they definitely worked hard over many years, um, but they're still challenging outstanding issues, but they say most have been resolved. The focus right now should be on these low probability events of managing severe and sustained droughts. That's really where the focus is and, and there's other issues they're working on as well, some legal issues. But from an engineering perspective, that's where the focus really is. So this, so if that 1980s drought happened again, we see what happened historically. The High Aswan Dam dove down and almost got to that minimum operation level before it came back up. 
And that's a cause for concern. So the implications of a severe drought, if that were to happen today, you would also see the High Aswan Dam fall down. And this is even a situation without the GERD. If the GERD didn't exist, you would see the High Aswan Dam come down and it would come again, very close to that, to that minimum operation level of 147. That'd be a critical situation. And that falls below those drought management zones. So they would have to invoke the reduction of five, 10, 15% um, usage and be a very, a very, a very scary time for Egypt for sure if the 80s drop came back again. So it'd be significant even without the GERD. If the GERD were to fill during a period like this, you would see the Aswan Dam go down very significantly. So water retained in the GERD would increase the impacts on Egypt during a drought. We don't doubt that at all. It's a small probability, but there would be there would be significant increases in, in, in impact um, as a result of the GERD under these low probability um, but high consequence events. At the same time, under this type of operational regime, the GERD would continue to fill, but in this continuous power operation range, it really wouldn't go down very much at all. It would delay the filling time, for sure, be longer than they would ideally want, but the impacts of drought on the GERD are comparatively small. So Egypt would be sitting in a situation with almost an empty reservoir and Ethiopian reservoirs would be almost full in this particular operation, which of course would be extremely contentious. Um, uh, and I, and I, I wouldn't believe that Ethiopia would hold on to all, to all that water when, when Egypt would be suffering downstream. So there's, so there's a lot of things that can be done in the, and the negotiating parties are working hard on trying to figure out ways to do this properly. So where does that leave the negotiations? Releasing uh, the, the um, so focusing on these low probability events and managing a severe and sustained drought. Releasing additional water, maintaining a critical hydropower generation for the GERD, also implementing conservation measures. Those are sort of the three kind of logical things to do to try to manage through a critical drought like this. So one way, well, a very basic thing is, is, is um, a, approach to filling the GERD is agreed minimum annual releases. It's a very simple mechanism using other, other river basins. The Colorado River is one as well. Um, the U.S. guarantees 1.5 million acre feet to Mexico every year. Um, they agree on how much they would simultaneously cut back during shortages, but it's a guaranteed release. Ethiopia could guarantee that minimum volume release during the filling period, regardless of, of the inflow. Right now, they say we will release this much, uh, some volume, or the inflow if it's really low. They could guarantee a release as well. And previous publication has sort of shown what the uh, what the distribution or how long it would take to fill up the reservoir um, under a, a basic approach like this. Now, this number, a fixed annual release could be temporary and that could change with time as well. It doesn't have to be a, a permanent thing for the future. This is really just during the filling period. But it may not be sufficient enough to deal with a multi-year drought like this. Okay, so the, the main thing that the countries have been looking at in the negotiations is releasing some of that stored water if a drought were to occur during the filling period. And how might that be done? Well, it could bring the GERD down during, the, uh, during that filling period, during the, the middle of a critical drought, and perhaps keep the Aswan Dam a little higher uh, to avoid hitting that bottom, hitting that critical situation. And how could one develop the rules to be able to do this? So one, the approach that has been taken is based on hydrologic conditions or the inflows into the, into the GERD reservoir. So to do this, you'd have, have to do a few things. First off, you'd have to define what you mean by a drought, whether that's a one-year drought, multi-year drought, a two-year, three-year, four-year drought, whatever you want. Decide how much water, additional water to release, how much water to release basically in addition to the, or in excess of the inflow or how much space to empty out in the reservoir. And then decide how to resume the filling after the drought subsides. Those are the things that the countries have been negotiating and have been working on for a while in a critical juncture. So here's one example of, of some of the rules. This is, this is uh, uh, an example that was developed from the Washington proposal, the Washington process that previous speakers have talked about. This was not accepted by Ethiopia, <clears throat> um, but it represents sort of one way of looking at this. 
And essentially it's a plot of the inflow on the bottom and the outflow or the release on the side. And the center line would be basically the inflow equals the outflow. And this point in the middle was chosen as, as 37 billion cubic meters as kind of an inflection point. And anything, uh, if, if the hydrology were lower than 37, the release would be greater than the inflow. And if the hydrology were, were wetter than 37, they would release less water than the inflow. So they'd be able to retain water during that time. <clears throat> so just a, a concept, even though this was not agreed upon at all, um, this is sort of the, the, the concept they were working with. An important point to this, this absolutely requires an agreement on the volume of the inflows. This requires that all countries agree how much water is coming in. So Ethiopia can release the appropriate amount of water based on that inflow. Again, it's another opportunity for good faith scientific collaboration. And this doesn't have to wait until an agreement is reached. Okay, so here's an example rule um, during a single year drought. So it's basically the same thing that I showed you, but in a, in a tabular format. So on the top is the annual inflows to the grid. So th this was all published in, in, the, in, the, in, in the letters that, 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 Egypt, that Egypt sent to the UN. Um, it's all public information here. Um, uh, so along the top is the annual inflows of the GERD. Along the side is the storage of the GERD. Uh, um, and this would be the amount of water they would release. So this is, this is during uh, the low period, if it's below 37 billion cubic meters of the, um, during a single year. Important points here. Again, proposals by all parties that everybody has made, Ethiopia, Egypt, Sudan, have all um, uh, assumed that the expected volumes would be, would be known. Um, so it requires that there's an agreement on how those volumes are calculated, those inflows are calculated. It's also important to, to mention that Ethiopia has required, asked that the inflow numbers adjust with the actual future inflows. They want to develop and use more water upstream, so they don't want to be fixed to certain numbers in these tables. They would like these to adjust over time. That's just a, a, another plot of the, of the same thing you saw, just uh, um, just the edge. But but one thing to notice is the minimum number is what's been under debate. So Egypt has been asking for a minimum elevation of 603. Ethiopia says, no, it should be higher at 610. So again, more areas for negotiation. Okay, when it comes to multi-year droughts, having a consistent approach for multi-year droughts, we can analyze the frequency of droughts at the GERD site to be able to do this. So uh, if you look at the LDM gauge, which is just, just within Sudan, um, we can see how variable things have been. And if you look at a 37 billion cubic meter threshold, we can see there's been about seven times that it's fallen below that 37 billion cubic meters. This is over, over a water year. So the probability of this, my calculation is about 6.4% probability you know, for a single year drought. Now, if you were to look at a four year average drought, so the orange is a four year average drought, it flattens, the, it flattens those lines a little bit. And if you were to use that same 37 billion cubic meters as a requirement, it only crosses a couple times, barely in there. So that's only a probability of about 2.8% um, likelihood. So we can develop a table that is basically a drought threshold versus the number of years included in a drought. And so this is the risk the risk of crossing a certain threshold of a drought. And we can easily say, okay, we can choose droughts of similar probability, whether it's a one-year drought, a two-year drought, a three-year, a four-year, five-year drought, we can choose a number of different droughts. Now, they, the, the negotiators have been, have been focusing on a four-year drought or a five-year drought um, through their negotiations. But essentially, <clears throat> essentially you can use a, a structure like this to try to figure out, okay, what these thresholds should be to be able to, to make them this way. We won't go any further into those details, but so where, again, where does that leave our negotiations? Well, if we look at our, our risk, really coming up with ideas and trying to come up with ways to be able to, well, the green line there represents ideas that we've been working on developing that tries to bring some of the water from the GERD down to try to protect the Aswan Dam um, and keep it up higher. And there certainly are ways to do that. The last thing is implementing conservation measures. I won't get too much into detail on that, but it comes in specifically with the notion of multi-reservoir coordination. 
Now, this is the way we would want to operate reservoirs ideally, all the reservoirs in much tighter coordination. Um, it's a common engineering problem that a lot of people, a lot of engineers work on, is how do you coordinate many reservoirs? This would be the preferred option, uh, especially political borders didn't exist. Uh, this is how, if, if, if Ethiopia were in charge of making sure Cairo had sufficient water in the agriculture areas, if Egypt had sufficient water, if Egypt, or if Egypt were in charge of making sure that, that Ethiopia, is they could develop, it would be a very coordinated manner. <coughs> but during drought operations, there clearly needs to be an agreement um, on what the prioritization, what the balancing of needs are to coordinate reservoirs like this. Egypt did propose a form of coordination early on in 2019, had very good concepts, but had some pretty obvious flaws in there as well that made it um, not palatable by Ethiopia. So without going into too much detail on it, just one, one sort of notion about this. So if we had our three reservoirs in a row, our big reservoirs, the GERD, Moroi, quite a bit smaller, and the High Aswan Dam, how you would typically operate reservoirs in series like this. If there were a drought that would come on, the lower reservoir would drop down first, and then it would hit some sort of threshold where demand management would come into play, where restrictions, were, where the, the, the releases would explicitly be limited. At that point, any further drought, the upper reservoirs would start, to would start to be drawn down as well, simultaneously to make sure that the minimum releases could be made um, uh, downstream. Then for drought recovery, the upper reservoirs would fill up first. However, while guaranteeing critical releases would be made and the lower reservoirs would finally fill last. Now, why would you do that? Well, the lower reservoirs have higher evaporation losses. You're trying to minimize the evaporation losses. You're also allowing any other, inf any other flows to be captured. You, don't, you, you want to try to min capture every bit of, a bit of water and minimize the losses, basically. OK, so what are some of the tangible steps that could be taken immediately towards reaching agreement? Now, throughout this talk, I mentioned different opportunities for good faith engineering and scientific collaborations. Establish data collection and transfer protocols. This could begin right away. How does the information get exchanged, particularly between the GERD and, and, the, and Rosario's Reservoir? Critical, but really, really everywhere. But <clears throat> this lays down the first couple of building blocks for, uh, for a solution. <clears throat> demonstrating dam safety with continuous updates throughout construction. This is absolutely critical for Sudan. And there's, 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 this is information that's, um, that's, that's necessary to, uh, to alleviate some of the concerns. Developing joint forecasting procedures to estimate inflows. All countries are assuming that forecasting, that the inflows will be known, but there's yet to be protocols on exactly how to determine those. And then further exploration of these multi-year droughts and management guidelines, um, like we're continuing to do and others are as well. So this helps prepare the ground for some sort of a durable agreement when the time does come. Rome wasn't built in a day either, and it wasn't done alone. So summary messages. GERD intercepts about 55% of the natural flows in Egypt. GERD is non-consumptive, and it cannot stop the average flows of the Nile. Egypt is currently well prepared to manage the filling. Sudan is at the greatest risk during this process. The GERD filling will cause the High Aswan Dam to decline, but it's most likely that there will be no additional shortages to Egypt. There's a tangible probability of small policy-induced shortages. And there's a low probability of severe shortages to Egypt. And that's what has to be addressed. Strategies do exist on how to fill the grid safely while protecting the High Aswan Dam and the Egyptian population. Many steps can be taken right now that can immediately lead to a more durable agreement. So at that, right about an hour, I will bring it to an end. That was wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Please uh, join me in uh, thanking Dr. Wheeler for an excellent presentation.
Um, we can't clap today because we're in this, <laughs> this uh, webinar format, but maybe you can express your appreciation in the chat. Um, we have questions coming in uh, in the Q&A tab, and I would encourage everybody to put their questions um, there. Um, I agree with comments that have been coming in in the, in the chat, uh, Kevin, that your presentation was a very clear, straightforward, you know, scientific and technical explanation that offers a lot of clarity and is a contrast to, you know, some of the heated and alarmist uh, rhetoric we've, we've seen. Um, someone said that we've never had a, that they've never heard a frank and depoliticized scientific explanation about the, the GERD like this. Um, and thank you for, for this talk. And to, you, to that point in the beginning, you said that it's careful to be, we have to be careful with the word crisis um, because that word is often politicized to mobilize, you know, particular um, actions by different actors. Um, so with that in mind, um, because we have such great questions coming in, I'm going to join, jump right to the questions. Um, the first one is by Richard uh, Loven, and forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name uh, correctly, but I will do my best. Uh, if the Jongle Canal is ever finished, would this reduce evaporation from the Sud and thus take longer for the pluvogenics in Ethiopia to slow filling of the GERD? Assumption is that most of the evaporation and the soot travels eastward over to the highlands where it feeds the Blue Nile. Uh-oh, I think Kevin is frozen. May have lost. Yeah, oh, here I'm you go. Oh, awesome, awesome. Wonderful. It was an interesting timing. Okay. Did, um, it's the first question. I don't know if you see it, but I, I don't know if you heard the, I read the first no, question. I didn't hear the question at all. It cut okay, out right let, okay, I'll reread it. So it's from Richard Loven. If the Jongle Canal is ever finished, would this reduce evaporation from the Sud and thus take longer for the pluvogenics in Ethiopia to slow filling of the GERD? Assumption is that most of the evaporation in the Sud travels eastward over to the highlands where it feeds the Blue Nile. Um, it cut out a little bit there, but I got, I got, I think I got that most of it. So the Jungle Eye Canal, um, certainly it's a different time stem. The, the Jungle Eye Canal um, was started decades ago and, and, and ceased. Um, if that, uh, I mean, it certainly could not be constructed in the time frame of 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 the of the um, of the filling of the GERD that's in progress right now. Um, the Jungle Eye Canal is a, would be a very challenging project engineering wise to uh, uh, to complete in general, and not to mention the incredible political challenges within um, to make that happen. Um, I do think that the Jungle Eye Canal is going to be something that's going. Um, that, that Egypt's going to want to put back on the table to look at different uh, different options of it. And I, and I, I don't know enough about I mean, the, the concept of the Jungle Eye Canal was basically uh, to cut a large trench through the Sud, through the Sud wetlands, and that would uh, uh, drain some of the water in the Sud. There's a lot of water in the, in the Sud right now. Uh, Lake Victoria has been is at its maximum. Um, and that would bring more water down in, in, into Egypt was sort of the concept. And that was developed by the British a long time ago. Um, uh, but they struggled a lot with environmental consequences of that. Uh, and that would have, that, that, in, in, as a pure engineer, maybe that could work, but I think it's one of those things that would be challenging to rush into and certainly is not gonna happen in the time frame of the GERD filling. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, the next question is from, uh, Anna Elisa Kaskau, thanks for the presentation and to bring the attention to Sedan's concerns regarding the filling of the GERD, which are too often ignored by academics and the media. The situation seems very critical to the Rosaria's Dam. Regard regardless if there will be or not a trilateral agreement, could we expect a bilateral one between Ethiopia and Sudan? Is that desirable or could it jeopardize the trilateral negotiations? Well. And agreements take place on multiple levels. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> there's treaty agreements between countries. Um, there can also be operational agreements between, between reservoirs as well. Um, there can be, uh, again, I would say building blocks. Um, 
it, it would be, it, I think it would be um, uh, naive to wait for one grand solution before the dam operators could talk to each other. A great solution may take a long time to be able to do, but the dam operators need to talk to each other. It's not, not, not an option. They have to talk to each other to do things safely. So to be able to build those, um, those, those agreements on how to share data and how to make sure things are done, that, 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 that doesn't undermine the process, that supports the process ultimately, because it will take a lot of work and effort to put those systems into place if and when a grand agreement is reached um, that, that includes both filling and long-term operations, um, those things can happen and be tested beforehand as well and need to be tested beforehand because they're not going to be fast. They're going to be difficult to do. Whether there's a bilateral agreement between the two, um, I, I, I can't say. I think, I think that, of course, Egypt's concern would, would, would be that, um, that, that they get left out of any agreement. Um, but I think it's very critical from an operational point of view that, uh, that operational agreements are reached. I think that ties into uh, the next question, which I think a few people have. Um, Richard Lobin asked the question again, uh, as well as Deja Mazzelli. I have the question as well. Uh, Richard asks, you speak about good faith cooperation, but Ethiopia has two civil wars. Egypt is back to a military dictatorship and Sudan barely has a government. What role is there for politics um, in, in good faith? And Dejan says, neither science nor engineering is the driver of the GERD negotiations. Um, and I kind of want to piggyback on that because I was wondering, just from your experience working in Colorado, the contexts are very different, right? States, US states are not going to go to war with each other over the river, although um, I know the politics can be contentious in Congress. Um, but you do have Mexico and the US uh, which are sovereign powers, but there's definitely a kind of clear power dynamic between Mexico and the U.S. and with with uh, the U.S. being the upstream user. And in the, around the Nile, you have these sovereign nations, and Egypt tr traditionally having more power over the or control and being the one with more power as the downstream user. So, um, just kind of based on your experience, what what does engender cooperation? Do the scientists kind of foster the collaboration? Have you seen that work where the scientists do it first and then that facilitates negotiation? Does that actually happen or, or do you have to, the scientists kind of have to wait for the bureaucrats to and politicians to figure it out? Well, so I was involved directly in those negotiations with Mexico. Um, yeah. And one of the most influential things that happened, and I, and I, I, I would have to say like, I, I, I was hired because I spoke Spanish. I, I knew all the Mexicans, but I was hired by the US to facilitate. <clears throat> um, one of the most, influential things was the politicians, um, they gave the technical people the freedom to, um, to explore solutions. They said, you have no decision-making authority, but you're, you are welcome to come up and we want you to come up with a report that gives us ideas and, and possible solutions. So it takes the there has to be political will. If there's no political will, nothing's ever going to happen. The, the, w every engineer realizes they're powerless compared to the politicians. There has to be political will to get things done. But at the same time, you have to let the, the technical um, aspects work with, work with each other to try to find solutions. Um, uh, Mexico wielded, that, wielded their, their strength. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they, uh, they do actually have excellent... Um, uh, technical and political people that, that stood their ground very well against the U.S. Um, and that's absolutely necessary to have, to have equal partners on both sides. Because if you have one disadvantage, the U.S. realized they could not um, squash uh, Mexico into an agreement. Mexico had to be empowered to make an agreement. Um, otherwise, they have no reason to make an agreement. Um, it's the same thing. You have to be negotiating with equals on the Nile, not one, not one dominant over the other. Um, uh, certainly those dynamics are more challenging within the Nile. They don't have a framework, uh, but there's also, um, uh, I mean, in, in, in the US and uh, Mexico, there was a mutual respect and understanding that Mexico had a right to, uh, to be able to use this water back in 1944, and the US um, recognized that that was, that was necessary. They had legitimate reasons. So. Um, I don't know if I answered the question directly, but uh, sufficiently. But it 
the collaboration has to happen on multiple levels simultaneously, technical to technical, legal to legal, policy to policy, and it all has to come back together um, in subcommittees oftentimes, dealing with individual problems, um, not everything all together in one, at the same time. Excellent. No, I think there's some really good takeaways in there about the importance of having equal partners and also the politicians giving the freedom to the engineers and scientists to come up with solutions. Um, thank you for that. And uh, you know, people can post it back in the questions if they have additional follow-ups. Um, Sami Hamad asks, are there ESIA and R, I don't know what these acronyms stand for, maybe you do. Uh, are there ESIA and I don't know, maybe that's impact assessment and RAP studies for the GERD, dam break analysis? If yes, are they accessible? If no, then why not? Um, no, that, that's it's been, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that was environmental environmental yeah. impact, yeah. I, I believe in endangered species. And um, no, there has not been. Now, Ethiopia did conduct several studies, um, including their own environmental impact study uh, within Ethiopia. Um, there was never a comprehensive study done in Sudan and Egypt downstream. <coughs> um, they attempted to do so through consultants. Um, a lot of reasons why they weren't able to execute those. They couldn't agree on baseline conditions. Um, but no, they're, they're, uh, the studies that have been conducted are, 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 are not, not very accept, accessible um, and, uh, um, and there aren't proper environmental impact studies. Um, one thing would be tremendously helpful is more transparency always of having, of having the ability to, because a, a lot of good work has been done, but oftentimes unless it's not um, apparent uh, or not, not accessible, then it's hard for people to, uh, to, to believe it. Uh, thank you. And, and a follow up. What is the effect of, uh, Sami asks, what is the effect of climate change on the filling of, of the GERD? So um, the one thing we, because we have such a, a long record um, in the Nile, uh, such an extensive record, we have evidence of very wet years, very dry years. Um, we know basically the range that it's going to be, and it could be, it could be very wet, it could be very dry. So climate change actually plays a pretty small part within the next few years. It's unlikely to be drier than we saw in the 1980s. It's unlikely to be wetter than we've seen. Um, I mean, it's been pretty wet recently. Um, overall, the climate signal in the Nile, and some studies say drier, some may stay, stay wetter, but most say getting a little wetter. Um, but the most, but slightly, I mean, there's a variation. One of the critical things we do see, um, some good work coming out of, uh, out, of, out of our colleagues at MIT, uh, is increased variability. Uh, so longer droughts, longer periods of flooding, so, so more fluctuations, basically. Um, but whether that'll impact during the filling, I, I don't think so. I think, I think we're, the filling we're talking about the next four or five, six years, maybe, um, while climate change is playing out on, on, on decadal scales and, and much longer than that. So I, I wouldn't, we, we can sample dry times, we can sample wet times um, and be prepared for all of those regardless of climate change. Great, um, I'm gonna move just in a different direction to Wubalem Fekade, who says excellent presentation and has a question. Uh, what is the baseline for calculating the numbers? Is not implicitly water allocation assumed, meaning current water use as givens? Is that I'm not sure? So, my yeah, yeah, I, I think I know what Obama was talking about. So, okay. so when you when you create the uh, when you create the, the 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 modeling to begin with, what you the first need to do is create a naturalized hydrology. So you have to back out existing uses, and this is the really good work that Deltaris did during their study. Um, was to naturalize, and this is the same thing we do for the Colorado River, um, and I've never been able to get this information from, 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 um, uh, from, um, from, from the, the NBI models, but, but you, you, you try to naturalize the hydrology, and then once it's naturalized, then you start implementing how much the users have, have, have consumed through history, um, and how much they'll, they'll consume in, into the future. So the, the, the basis um, you go backwards in time, you, you, you create a data set that uh, is as if humans weren't there. And we can, we can do that because we have pretty good estimates on, on consumptive uses. Um, uh, and um, yeah, and then move forward. So that it's, it's a, very, a very standard engineering type process to be able to, to develop models like this. Um, 
Um, so hopefully got Mubalam's question right. Great. Great. Um, this is this is great. The questions are coming in. Keep coming. Uh, Sami <laughs> asked, in case the Nile Basin countries signed the cooperative framework agreement for the Nile Basin Initiative, will this serve as a platform for operation of the transboundary cascade of dams? Mm. Well, I, 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 the, the, the CFA is, is, is obviously something that, that uh, they've worked on for a long time in Egypt. Um, Egypt and Sudan uh, did not chose to not sign the CFA. Lots of debates about incorporation of historic rights. Um, it sets up an overall an overall framework. Uh, um, it doesn't get into specifics of how things would operate. Um, it doesn't lay out specific water rights at all. Um, but it, it lays out the principles uh, of, of equitable reasonable utilization. Um, no significant harm, I believe, is, is but it. it uh, so I, I don't, it doesn't get down to the operational details that that would still certainly be, um, be required. Again, there, there's different levels of agreements. One would be an overall policy agreement. Others might be operational agreements. Um, uh, but certainly uh, difficult without having, uh, without having um, Sudan and, and Egypt as, as, as signatories to it. Uh, but I think everybody hopes that at some point there will be a comprehensive agreement. But I can't get much more into that without getting too political, and I try to avoid that. Right. Um, well, this one is a kind of straightforward question from Rafael Tae. Do you think Ethiopia is on schedule to complete what percentage of the third filling and start initial test operations of the two turbines this year? Well, um, from what I've seen, I've, and I've, been, try, I've been trying to Trying to watch, and so far, I mean, every, all the satellite images I've seen recently still shows water flowing over that 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 spillway, um, which would indicate to me that they haven't um, started uh, passing water through the through the bottom outlets yet. So they're not they're not continuing the construction. Yet. I, I might be off on that. Some people in the audience may have more up to date knowledge than I have about that. <coughs> um, so my assumption is that that most effort is focused on getting the turbines running, um, and that and 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 that can. That work can go simultaneously. They don't have to start construction to be able to continue the, the, the turbines. The focus really is and should be on, on, on getting, getting power production um, rather than building up the, the wall higher. Um, they can start to reap some of the benefits from it right now at the current elevation that it's at. Uh, uh, so as soon as it, it, as soon as it uh, dries out enough to be able to continue construction, I would assume that that would happen, but I, I don't. I, I can't say for sure exactly on if it's gone up or, or what will happen. I, I imagine I imagine there will be a rush to try to construct every dry season moving forward, and um, they weren't able to construct um, as much last year as as we thought that they might. Um, so I imagine there'll be similar challenges this year, um, just particularly with a lot of the transformation that that and um, logistical things are just been very difficult as well. So. I have a kind of minor follow-up to that, um, just in terms of that transparency of knowing the status of the dam. Is there currently communication among at least the engineers uh, across, like with, between Ethiopia and Sudan and, and Egypt about the status? Um, I honestly don't know. Um, I, 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 um, it has been uh, particularly difficult to, to, to communicate with, with my colleagues. I, I, I spent some time in the Ethiopian dam uh, prior uh, and had um, spent a lot of time in Sudan, uh, but due to the political situations there, I haven't been able to visit those countries very often. So I, I don't think there is, but I, I may be wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'm wrong. I'm hoping that the people at the dam sites do have some mechanism of communication because it, it is very important um, regardless of, of what's going on uh, politically. Great, um, thank you so much. There are more questions, um, but unfortunately we're at time and you've done an excellent job, both your presentation, answering all the questions. Um, please everyone join me again in thanking Dr. Wheeler uh, for his talk today. Um, and now I wanna hand uh, the mic, so to speak, over to Dr. Ed Keller, co-convener and organizer of this, of this critical webinar uh, series. And please, Ed, take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. AC. Uh, excellent uh, moderation and uh, moderator's role, I should say. And excellent presentation. Thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, 
uh, Kevin's presentation. Uh, I uh, have the responsibility of sort of like transitioning to the rest of the webinar. And uh, I, I wanna uh, I think, uh, I wanna sort of, uh, sort of try to encapsulate the next uh, three presentations because they kind of uh, show how this all hangs together. Uh, next week, uh, uh, on the 9th of, uh, uh, next two weeks, uh, 9th of February, uh, we have a presentation called the Now Basin Reservoir Management and Operations Tools. And uh, we have two people who will make the presentations then. One is uh, Mohammed Bashir, uh, who is a PhD uh, uh, fellow uh, at, uh, at Manchester University. Uh, and he's uh, going to especially focus on the management of transboundary rivers uh, in his uh, presentation. Uh, by the way, uh, Mohammed is Sudanese. Uh, and uh, he will be accompanied uh, in, in a sort of uh, uh, dual uh, role as, as a presenter with Hisham El Eldaderi, uh, who uh, is going to, uh, he's from. Uh, the uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in the United States. Uh, uh, he focuses on uh, the uh, promise of the promises of GERD relating to the, the delivery of hydropower in the now basin countries and beyond. Uh, that should be an interesting uh, dual uh, presentation. Uh, you know, uh, with with these young uh, scholars weighing in on the future. And on February 23rd, we have uh, a webinar presentation by Professor Suzanne Scheimer, Scheimer of the University of Delft in, in the Netherlands. And uh, she will focus on successful water basin agreements in areas uh, similar to the now to consider uh, lessons learned about water sharing and sustainable resource uh, management. And uh, our wrap up session is going to be very interesting because it pulls everything we've been talking about together for those river rain uh, uh, countries, uh, uh, upstream countries that we haven't said much about. It's going to be presented by uh, Dr. John uh, Mbaku who's a native of Kenya, uh, one of the countries uh, most involved uh, in, in the river rain politics of today. Uh, and uh, he's from Weaver State in uh, Utah. And uh, he has co-authored a book uh, with a, a colleague uh, from Kenya uh, called Governing the Nile Basin. Uh, and this book uh, focuses on the need for a new legal regime and a long-term solution uh, and, and, and also management options for both upstream and downstream countries uh, that depend on Nile waters. And it seems to me that's just where we need to be in, with this discussion. Uh, with uh, that, with um, Baku's presentation, we will close our webinar session for uh, the past two quarters with a bang, raising issues uh, relating to water sharing in uh, of the waters of the Nile, uh, uh, and uh, carefully uh, consider, we'll carefully consider the geopolitical and scientific realities of the 21st century. Uh, put it all into context. Thanks for coming. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and see you in the next two weeks. All right, thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah.